America is no stranger to famous serial killers. Indeed, some of the most infamous serial murderers in history committed their crimes in the United States. However, these killers tend to be thought of as a modern occurrence. America's most infamous serial killers, people like Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Charles Manson, or the Zodiac Killer, were active in the 20th century. However, serial killers are not a modern development. I'm the Lunar Librarian, and today's case is that of the Harp Brothers, the first documented serial killers in the United States, and their revolution-era crime spree that took the lives of 39 people. Alright, so I forgot to record this with the actual video, but uh, this video contains discussion of sexual assault and violence towards children, so if you're not okay with that, then maybe skip this one. Although Makaja and Wiley Harp are typically known as the Harp brothers, they were actually cousins. Records of their birth are questionable, but Makaja was most likely born in 1748. His younger cousin Wiley was born a few years later, in 1750. The cousins' families lived close together in a Scottish settler community in Orange County, North Carolina. Like many other Scottish settler families, the Harps were Calvinist Protestants and open Tories. In this context, Tory refers to an American colonial who supported the King and the British Empire, as opposed to independence. During the Regulator War in North Carolina, both Makasia and Wiley's fathers joined a Tory militia fighting against the Regulators. The Harp family's Tory sentiments made them outcasts among broader colonial society, and growing up, Makasia and Wiley were therefore excluded from interacting with the other children. This didn't seem to matter, however, as the two cousins were inseparable. As children, the pair did almost everything together. Sometime in early 1775, Makasia and Wiley made plans to leave the family home and seek overseer work on a plantation. However, these plans would be put on hold at the outbreak of the American Revolution. Like their fathers, Makasia and Wiley began serving as Tory militiamen fighting against the American revolutionaries. Unlike their fathers, Makasia and Wiley were not particularly discerning with their targets. In addition to attacking the revolutionary military, the two would target women and children associated with the Patriot movement, or with members of it. Sometime in 1775, the Harps, along with a third unidentified Tory, were involved in the kidnapping and sexual assault of Mary Walden, Harriet Eskridge, and Charlotte Fitzhugh. All three women were the daughters of North Carolina Patriot volunteers. After this attack, the Harps' whereabouts were unknown until 1780, when they participated in the Battle of Kings Mountain. Here, Captain John Wood injured Makasia. After he recovered from his wounds, the Harps participated in the Battle of Black Stocks in 1780 and the Battle of Cowpens in 1781. After the British were defeated at the Battle of Yorktown, the Harps fled from North Carolina with the British allied Chickamauga Cherokee. However, before they fled, the two kidnapped John Wood's daughter, Susan Wood, apparently as an act of revenge for Makasia's earlier injury. The two would force Susan into a marriage with Makasia Wood, although they would both regularly assault her. The Harps continued to live in the town of Nikajek with the Chikamuaga for approximately 13 years. During this time, the two kidnapped another woman, Maria Davidson. In addition to kidnapping and assaulting women, the Harps continued to strike at the United States settlements along the frontier. On April 2nd, 1781, the two joined a Cherokee war party which attacked the frontier settlement of Bluff Station. In 1782, the Harps joined another war party at the Battle of Blue Licks, and again in 1788, the two were involved in another raid on Bluff Station. However, in 1794, the Harps fled Nikajik, escaping a raid by Patriot militias, and disappeared until 1797, when they resurfaced near Knoxville, Tennessee. 
It was here in Knoxville that the Harps began the killing spree for which they are infamous. Their first victim was a man only identified as Johnson. His body was found in a river with his chest cavity split open and his torso weighed down with stones. This would become the Harps' preferred method of disposing of their victims. Eventually, the two fled Tennessee and headed north into Kentucky near the Cumberland Gap, where the majority of their murders would occur. The Harps preyed upon travelers and salesmen in the Kentucky frontier, robbing and murdering anyone unfortunate enough to cross their path alone. The two would reportedly kill anyone, even children, at the slightest provocation. The Harps continued their crime spree through the woods of Kentucky until 1799, when the Harps murdered John Langford. When Langford turned up dead, an innkeeper pointed authorities in the direction of the Harps. The two were arrested for the murder and jailed in Danville, Kentucky while awaiting trial. However, they managed to escape jail and go on the run again. Desperate to have the Harps returned to custody, Kentucky Governor James Girard placed a $300 bounty on each of the Harps. However, despite the massive reward on their heads, the Harps managed to evade capture again. With their kidnapped wives Susan and Maria, as well as their three children in tow, the Harps made their way to Cave In Rock, Illinois. Cave In Rock was home to Samuel Mason, Mason ran a gang of river pirates who preyed upon boats traveling the Ohio River. The Harps needed a place to hide, and Mason saw the value in recruiting two combat veterans. So when the Harps asked to join his gang, Mason agreed. However, it was not long before Mason would regret this decision. Samuel Mason and his gang were all hardened criminals. Many of them were murderers. However, even this gang of experienced and notorious pirates found themselves appalled by the Harps' actions. Mason and the gang weren't above killing to get a job done. However, the Harps seemed to revel in torturing and humiliating their victims before killing them. The final straw for Mason was when the Harps began to strip prisoners naked, make them hike almost half an hour to the top of a large bluff, and force them to jump to their death. Such an act of psychological torture and wanton murder was too far, even for a pirate, and so Mason forced the Harps to leave Cave In Rock under threat of death. After being evicted from the Mason gang, the Harps returned to Tennessee, where they continued their killing spree. Without a supply of frontier travelers, the Harps instead preyed upon low-class laborers, farmers, slaves, and children across Tennessee. Macasia even murdered his own infant daughter by bashing her head against a tree when she annoyed him. This was the only murder either of the Harps admitted any remorse over. In 1799, the two came across the home of the Stigall family. Mrs. Stigall, unaware of the identity of the two, offered the Harps a place to stay. Unfortunately for her, they accepted. However, during the night, the Harps were awoken by the crying of Miss Stigall's four-month-old son. In irritation, Macasia Harp killed the infant. When Mrs. Stigall discovered her infant son dead, she was understandably distraught. However, the Harps again found her to be irritating and murdered her for crying as well. In addition to Mrs. Stigall and her child, the Harps murdered another guest of the family who tried to intervene in the killings. After the murder of Mrs. Stigall and her child, another posse would be organized to hunt down the Harps. This posse was formed by John Leiper and would include Mrs. Stigall's husband, Moses Stigall. Leiper and Moses eventually tracked down the Harps, managing to intervene before the pair murdered another victim, this time George Smith. The posse, now with Smith in tow, pursued the Harps as the pair fled. In the chase, the pair were separated. Wiley Harp managed to escape his pursuers. However, Macasia Harp was not as lucky. While he was riding, Leiper managed to shoot Macasia in the leg, knocking him from his horse. 
The two men struggled briefly before Leiper injured Makasia with a tomahawk. Moses and Leiper then proceeded to beat Makasia Harp to death before decapitating him with Leiper's tomahawk and placing his head on a stake outside of the Stigall home. With Makasia dead, Wiley was left alone. With almost no options left, Wiley rejoined the Mason gang. Despite his disgust with the Harps, Sam Mason apparently let Wiley rejoin. Wiley remained with the gang for another four years, living as a river pirate in Illinois until 1803. Eventually, the Mason gang, Wiley included, was captured by authorities. Since Wiley was living under the alias of John Sutton at the time, he was not immediately recognized as one of the infamous Harps. While awaiting trial, Wiley, Mason, and the rest of the gang escaped custody. During the escape, however, Mason was shot and seriously injured. While Mason was alive, his condition was critical. Wiley, as well as fellow gang member Peter Alston, decided that Mason's injuries made him a liability, and decided to turn Mason into the authorities to collect a bounty. This would, ironically, be Wiley Harp's last mistake. Harp and Alston killed Mason and brought his body to a bounty office to claim the reward on their former leader. However, while on the way to deliver Mason's corpse, someone recognized Alston as a criminal himself. The pair were arrested and eventually convicted of piracy and numerous murders. Both Wiley Harp and Peter Alston were executed by hanging in January 1804. They were then decapitated and their heads were placed on stakes along the Natchez Trace. With that, the violent story of the Harps ended. Makasia and his cousin Wiley hold the dubious honor of being the United States' first serial killers, and to this day remain among its most prolific. It is ultimately impossible to determine how many victims the Harps killed. It is confirmed that the pair killed at least 39 people. However, it is possible their killing spree claimed over 50 victims, and when factoring in the people killed earlier during their activities in the Revolutionary War, the number of victims the Harps claimed could go as high as 80 people. I've been the Lunar Librarian, and if you've enjoyed today's video, please consider giving it a like. I make historical true crime videos once a week, so if that sounds interesting, then why not subscribe? Thanks for watching, and goodbye.